welcome to the Dr. Bubbs Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Bubbs, and this is the Athlete Evolution Series. We're here in Manchester, England, to talk with professional boxer Scott Quigg and his performance nutritionist, Dr. Scott Robinson, on how they prepare for world-class boxing. Scott Quigg is the former undefeated British super bantamweight champion and WBA super bantamweight title holder and is currently ranked the number one British featherweight. Dr. Scott Robinson, PhD, is a performance nutritionist working with elite athletes in Premier League football and rugby, as well as professional fighters in boxing and MMA. What does it take to be the best of the best? How do these types of athletes, boxers, MMA fighters, combat sports, prepare for these big events? We're gonna take a closer look and find out. Gents, thanks so much for taking the time out today. Why don't we kick off this conversation, Doc, by telling viewers a little bit more about your background and how you got into performance nutrition. Yeah, sure. So I um, guess, like, uh, guess like many others, sport nutritionists, I was just generally interested in sport when I was younger. Um, played a lot of football, um, made it to a reasonable level. Uh, didn't quite cut the mustard at the, at the top stage, though. So I thought, okay, I'll go and do a degree in sports science and, and learn a little bit more in that field and then try and branch into sport that way. Nice. Um, yeah, so studied sports science at undergrad level. Um, was lucky to intern at Everton Football Club um, with their sports science department, then continued on to do a master's uh, in sport and exercise physiology with a side focus on nutrition. Uh, and then was really lucky to get a PhD at Birmingham University, um, which more specifically looked into, into nutrition. Um, and that's where my kind of, you know, fondness for nutrition really kind of, you know, grew. Um, started working with athletes on a on a one to one basis and with teams as well, and and that's just how I came into it really. Terrific. And you, Scott, when did you know you wanted to become a professional boxer? Um, I mean, first sport was football, well, soccer. Um, I was, you know, a very good soccer player, and up until the age of fifteen is when. You know, I stopped playing. I was at uh, Burnley Football Club, which is a you know a decent level football club over here. It was in the Premiership at the time, um, and that was my first sport. When I got released at that, then I I thought this is you know I need to find something that I need to you know that I want to do. And I'd always it, while playing football, I was into Thai boxing, Muay Thai, and I'd been doing that since I was 11. And I'd had like 78 Thai boxing fights, 176, lost one, drawn one. Wow. So I was quite good at that. Um, but I'd always wanted to do boxing. So well, like I said, when I stopped football, I went to the local amateur gym, had a couple of amateur fights, won them, won the national championships. And then it, to be honest with you, it was probably the best thing I'd, I'd done. Uh, best decision I've made and from then I've never looked back. All right, Doc, when did you decide to start working with Team Quig? Yeah, so uh, it was actually a call from Scott's uh, strength conditioning coach. Um, I was actually, funnily enough, sitting in the supermarket uh, car park at the time, so it was quite apt really. Um, and yeah, had a, had a call from uh, the SNC coach and, and he just said that himself and Scott have been watching the work that I've been doing with the other boxers and, and they'd be interested in a conversation and then we decided to meet up for a coffee and, uh, and it just went from there really. Awesome, and Scott, when did you decide to bring on Doc as part of your performance team? I, I, I'd had one in the past, you know, obviously when I was 22, I brought one in on board and we'd done a bit of work because obviously I'm always looking to ways to improve and you know, when with, with boxing, you've got to make a weight and then obviously nutrition and, and performance is, you know, the link. You know, to get the best performance, you have to be fueling your body with the with the right food, with the right nutrition. And you know, so early on, when I was like say roughly around 22, I had one then, and I did a lot of testing. And then, as time goes on, your body changes, and I was still making the weight fine. And I think it was I fought Oscar Valdez on in March, March the 10th uh, for the featherweight world title, and I didn't make weight. Um, one of the main reasons was is because I, I'd fractured my foot, uh, so I couldn't really, for the last four weeks of camp, I couldn't really train. Oh, wow. um, so that was, but 
I knew my body had um, changed and, and I needed to make a statement and I needed to come back with a, you know, and, and make improvements still. So obviously I'd heard about Scott and, and seen some of the Scott's work he's done and I knew some of the fighters he worked with. And for about a four, four month, five month period, even before the Valdez fight, I'd heard of you know, Scott and seen some of the work he'd been doing. So I, I knew quite a lot about him and done a bit of research on him myself prior to working with him. And when we um, met up and had a coffee and discussed, I, I'm big on first impressions. You know, and the professionalism, the way we spoke and everything. I, I, I like the, the tone of it and to be honest with you, it's been the best decision I've made. All right, let's talk pre-camp testing. What type of tests are you running on an athlete like Scott in preparation for a big fight? Yeah, sure, that's a good question. Um, it, it's probably the most important part of camp is, is making sure that we get the, the test done at the start of camp and, and also in good time. So usually I'll ask the, the fighters that I work with and what's great about Scott is we did this really early on, but usually I'll ask for about eight to 12 weeks um, before the actual fight night um, to, to do the test so that we get ourselves a good baseline, we know exactly where we're at. Um, in terms of the testing, um, there'll be a few key tests. There may be others that we look to include depending on the results of certain tests, but generally we'll, we'll do a, a VO2 max and lactate threshold test just to, just to see where the, the fitness and the metabolic efficiency is at and also to set those heart rate training zones that the S&C coach and, and Scott can then work off. Um, we also do a full bloods panel um, to look for kind of levels of essential minerals and proteins just to see really if there's any deficiencies there and then we can look to correct those if, if, if any do uh, show up. Probably the two most valuable I would say would be a resting metabolic rate assessment. Um, so, you know, obviously we know that we can predict resting metabolic rate through prediction equations. There's a few different ones out there, um, but sometimes they can be very different to what is actually measured in the lab. Um, and in Scott's case, there was around about a 450 calorie difference at the start of camp from what was estimated if we'd have just thrown in his height, weight, age, etc., and what we actually measured, which then would have thrown us out by about 450 calories each day, um, which would add up massively over the course of a, a week and a month in a camp. And can you walk viewers through what that process is like with, with using a resting RMR and you know, what that test is like? Yeah, sure. So it's probably the easiest test that, that Scott yeah. will ever do. <laughs> the, hard, the hardest thing for Scott was to not fall asleep. Um, essentially, just lie down uh, flat on a, a bed for 30 minutes with a face mask, mask on, uh, which then measures the volume of uh, oxygen consumed and carbon dioxide produced. And from that, we can get a, a measure of resting metabolic rate, which is the amount of calories that the body would burn if it was to stay at rest all day. So that's a really good baseline in terms of knowing how many calories the, the athlete will need. And then we add an activity factor on top of that. So whether Scott has a rest day, training once, training twice, the intensity duration of his sessions, we use that as a baseline and then build on that to, uh, to, to kind of pitch calories so they're as accurate as possible and make sure that the weight cuts as, as good as possible too. Um, from that as well, we can also look at um, the respiratory quotient, um, which is essentially fuel use uh, at rest, so the amount of carbohydrate and fat that, that Scott's using, um, and really just see what his metabolic efficiency is like at rest. And if it's a, in a place where we wouldn't really like it to be, maybe he's burning more carbohydrates than we'd like at rest, then we can look at certain nutritional interventions to bring that down. But as, as would have it, Scott's RQ was 0.71, which is almost a complete fat burner, which was, which was incredible, really. So it's a good start. And if we go to the other end of the spectrum, which is the VO2 max test, and you mentioned the lactate threshold, obviously pretty intense test. What is that um, telling you in terms of the feedback you're going to give to the coaches in terms of how he trains? Yeah, exactly. So the, the, the main feedback would be that sometimes you can have a high VO2 max, so the size of your engine is good, um, the capacity of it, but in fact that sometimes the lactate threshold can be you know, not particularly high or not where we'd like it to be. Um, sometimes it can be vice versa as well. So really it just helps us to fine tune the kind of strength conditioning, aerobic and anaerobic based work that Scott will do. Um, and the great thing about that test is, it, like I said, it provides the different heart rate training zones that Scott can then go away and make sure that he kind of hits each of those zones each week so that he's training all the different energy systems. Terrific. So that's directly informing how he's going to train yeah. in the process, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, 
Sorry, just to say that one, the one other test that we'll do is uh, body composition assessment. Um, so usually we'll use uh, DEXA scan for that. Again, just a really easy test where you just sit down uh, on a bed um, and it uses um, basically absorbed geometry to measure the, the uh, different densities of the body tissues so that we can get a really accurate measure of lean tissue mass, fat mass, um, and also check bone health as well, which is super important, particularly for the boxers. Um, and then sometimes that can guide the nutrition intervention. Um, it's not uncommon for boxers to really struggle with the weight and then they'll get onto a DEXA scan and we'll actually see that, well, in order to make the weight, they need to lose 15 kilos, but actually they only have eight kilos of body fat because their bone mineral density is very high and they're actually yeah. carrying a lot of muscle mass which directly informs the nutrition intervention and says, okay, well, we can look to reduce fat, but in order to do it right and to do it well, we're going to need to lose some muscle. And sometimes that invokes fear into athletes because they think, okay, well, if I lose muscle, I'm going to be losing strength and power. But then it's about reassuring the athlete that we can, you know, we can make the most out of that muscle that they have, um, but we'll need to drop some to make the weight safely. Nice. And is that a reason why you choose to use the DEXA over other things like a body composition caliper testing or let's say yeah. BIA? Yes, a lot of the time it comes down to practicality. So we'll try and do each of these tests, the RMR, lactate threshold, DEXA, blood tests, about three times, two to three times per camp, just so that we're keeping on top of it. Um, sometimes it's not always practical, um, so we might look to use the calipers. Um, some people may say it's comparing apples and oranges, and, and they might be right to some extent, um, but sometimes we just have to roll with what we've got. Um, but sometimes the calipers can be, can be useful as well. Definitely in terms of that. Uh, on field, being able to apply them just right then and there, pretty pretty important. And yeah. what about on the blood testing side of things? Are there certain metrics that you're looking for, whether it's from an athlete health perspective or even performance perspective for, yeah, for the so, fighters? Yeah, so we'll we'll look at a whole variety of different markers. But for me, the key key ones would be to look at the vitamin D. So we'll look at bioavailable and uh, serum 25 OHD uh, vitamin D. We know that most athletes are deficient in vitamin D in the winter months, um, and it's important for protecting the immunity. Um, but there's more and more research coming out to show that it's now important for things like uh, muscle function, muscle health, brain and cognitive function, um, et cetera. So we'll make sure that vitamin D is uh, corrected if there's a deficiency there. Um, and other ones would be related to energy metabolism. Um, so that would be the likes of uh, uh, iron, uh, ferritin, folate, uh, vitamin B12, uh, and those two. And generally, most boxes seem to be okay in most, but usually there's two or three uh, markers to, to improve on. Terrific. And if we round things out here, sweat testing, I know as well, is a pretty important one for fighters. Is that one that you guys are implementing with the... Team Quig? Yeah, so yeah, so Scott's done all the all the sweat tests. Um, again, just another super easy test, isn't it? Yeah. Really, um, it, it's an absolutely brilliant test. It's uh, it basically um, what happens is they stick two electrode patches on on the forearm, and they make the skin artificially sweat, and then they measure the amount of sodium that's in, in that given amount of sweat. Um, athletes can vary in the amount of sweat that they lose, um, but also in the amount of sodium as well. So that's really important in terms of tailoring the hydration strategy to make sure that whatever Scott's losing in terms of the total amount of sweat, but also the composition of that sweat, we're putting back into his body. Um, I think the sweat test guys use a cool analogy, which is like, it's like going, if you don't sweat test, it's like going into a shoe shop and they're only being size seven available. It just doesn't work for most athletes. So, uh, so yeah, we just try and make it the hydration protocol as bespoke as possible. And that's where the, the hydration sweat test can come in really useful. And Scott, how different was this for you from previous camps? It's, it's the, there's no guessing. Everything, all the testing that we've done and do now is, it's on paper though. Everything's right, so we, everything's structured right. It, the performance in, in training is miles, you know, 100 times better. So there's no, me, me, I'm not feeling tired in the gym. I'm, I'm thinking quicker, I'm performing better. and. And the main thing is, is I'm enjoying the, the training. Do you know, I feel like I'm improving. And the main thing in that is, again, all that since since bringing linking up with Scott, nothing's being guessed. You know, we're not guessing. You know, how many calories I would be naturally burning. Every all the testing that we've done. So I'm not worrying. I'm not stressing. 
thinking, which is a big, which is prior to the prior to working with Scott for probably four or five fights before bringing him on board and part of the team. A lot of the camps I was stressing, you know, thinking, is this right? Um, are we doing this? Do we need to be doing this? Um, are we doing the right stuff? That's took all that away because it's all facts that we know what we're doing, we know what we need to do. And since bringing everything in and implementing the, the results, what we need to do and the strategies in now, it's, you know, it's like night and day. Yeah, I was going to say that that trust factor between practitioner and athlete is a really big piece. How important is that buy-in, building that trust between you and Doc as a practitioner? As soon as, you know, speaking to Scott, the first time we, I, I met, I, I'm big on first impressions and straight away I liked everything he was saying. I thought, you know, I bought into it as in, I thought, no, this is, you know, this sounds very good and obviously it's only the first time we'd met and then each time we'd, we'd linked up and, you know, the testing, the strategies, what he said we we're going to be doing, straight away I bought into it and that is the key thing is the trust, whatever he says I need to do, I will do because, again, it comes back to trust and the first camp we've worked together, everything went, it was flying, so that trust now is even more solid. And how crucial is that for your mindset to be able to just put all that on, on, on Doc here and be yeah. able to trust yeah. in it and not have yeah. to worry about that so that you can go about your training intensely and doing the things you need to do to prepare? Definitely, it's especially through missing the weight um, prior to bringing him on board. Obviously, I could say there was a, obviously because I fractured my foot and the training was hampered, but bringing him on board, that stress and my mind was at peace because I thought, he, that's in his hands. Whatever he, you know, he give me his honest opinion. Said, I asked him, can I make the weight? You know, because obviously I was worrying and stuff like that. And he went, don't worry, we've done all the testing. This is this is this. This is what the, every can be, you'll make the weight no problem. So straight away from there, I didn't worry. I didn't stress. I could fully focus on the training and and the boxing, because at the end of the day, that's what I do when I'm in the ring. And as you know, boxing, it's a dangerous sport. So you've got to be in there fully focused on what you've got to do. And, and that's with, you know, obviously, Scott, his job is to do that. The nutrition, my boxing coach is the one who, with the boxing, my strength and conditioning is this, this. So everyone's got their own, it's just like a jigsaw, you're putting each piece together and I don't have to stress thinking, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that. I can just fully focus on what he tells me to do, what the boxing trainer tells me to do, what the, my conditioning trainer to do. I just follow instructions then. Yeah, it's terrific when you can just execute rather than having to worry about yeah, things. It's yeah. terrific. And yeah. if we kind of fast forward through the process now and you're getting into that week before weigh-in, how does the nutrition strategy change in that final week? Doc, can you walk us through maybe some of the you know, old school traditional strategies that have been used by fighters for a long time that you know, potentially problematic versus some yep. of the more evidence-based approaches that you're using with uh, fighters yeah, like... Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, some kind of crazy, crazy stories out there, really. Um, and I think, you know, that's where it's been great for me to come in. And I've said to Scott before, it's, you know, I see this as obviously a job, um, but at the same time, the best part about it for me is just helping Scott and, and the other guys be able to do it well but be able to do it safely as well because there's a lot of dangerous practices out there it's not uncommon that there's uh you know a lot of kind of prolonged sauna use uh sweatsuit use um you know i've seen it before where guys are killing themselves in the gym the night before the morning of the kind of weighing putting their bodies through you know kind of traumatic stress right before a time they're going to put it through stress again in the ring um you know, just not eating. Sometimes athletes just won't eat at all. Uh, and then sometimes they can't sustain that and they might try not to eat for four, five, six, seven days before the weigh-in um, and not drink anything either. So they're just putting their bodies through such stress and in actual fact, they just don't, it's, it's not necessary in 99% of circumstances. And if it is necessary, then they're, they're fighting in the wrong weight category. 
Um, and what are some of those consequences if they're doing some of these strategies that are going to be compromising? Yeah. You know, what are the consequences for them come fight night? Because you know, yeah. whether it's 24 or 36 hours later, it's not a lot of time to be able to... Yeah, I mean, you can have the... I think there's, there's two, con two main sections of the consequences. There's obviously the physiological, that, but then also the psychological as well. You know, particularly if that other person sees their, their opponent making the weight pretty well or having no real issues. So it has a psychological impact. Um, but obviously a physiological impact as well in, in terms of what you can actually replace in terms of the fluids and the fuel um, uh, and really the degree of the stress that you've put the body under. Sometimes it's not always possible even using the best practices to get yourself back to that 100% state when you actually step into the ring. And for you, Scott, as the athlete, how does that actually feel in that week leading up to making weight? Some of the methods that, you know, Scott was just going through then, you know, I've used in the past, you know, to, to have to hit the weight you know, there's certain things that, you know, you do to, as a fighter, you, all you think about is having to hit the weight and you, you know there's certain ways that it, it, it ain't good for you, but it's the only way, you, you know, because you're not educated and you haven't got the right people around you, it's the only way you're going to make the weight. And you know what, sometimes the, the consequences, like I said, can be, you know, it's getting beat, getting knocked out, and or, you know, you've you've seen in over the years, you know, fighters that have in combat sports that have, you know, had serious injuries, and you know, it's been life-threatening injuries. You know, so it's, you know, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous thing to do, it. and it's like now more people are more educated, and and people are, you know, more aware of and. There's more people like Scott giving advice to you know, to, especially to the younger fighters coming through now. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully, you know, them old school methods are getting pushed away for good. Uh, but like the the normally the week of the fight, I'm normally grumpy. Uh, no one will even come near me because. Um, angry and like I say I'm grumpy, I'm snapping at people because it wasn't, I was used to cut all down on my fluid, my food, um, and in my body, like I say, my body and my mind would be under stress and I'd be very agitated. This camp, you know, since just working with Scott, I'm smiling, I'm eating the week of the fight, um, fluid, drinking, I, I, I think it was on the when Tuesday and the Wednesday I had two days of where I didn't do any training. I was just resting, and my weight still coming down because of the you know I'm eating the right food and my my metabolism's still you know running at a really good you know speed. So it was it's light like night and day, and and I just wish I would have been working with Scott since the start of my career, or six years ago, you know, and it, because this camp, the, well, the last camp was the, probably the happiest camp that I've ever had due to, and the only difference was, was Scott. There you go, it's amazing, isn't it? The connection between the nutrition, mm -hmm. cognitive function, um, you know, that's such a strong aspect, as we talked about before, of mindset yeah. and everything else, and, yeah. you know, so you feel getting the nutrition on point was a big factor in being able to that, that Keep was, yourself level in that important week leading up to the weigh-in. Hundred percent. That that was the the food, the nutrition. I'm a big believer of that that's what for me anyway. That's what keeps me my mindset right. You know the, the, what I fuel my body with. You know that's how my body's gonna run. And, and any foods off limits in that week? Uh, things that we gotta yeah, cut out. <laughs> but 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 but. but there's a few that are off limits, which obviously it will go into, but I was surprised that, um, what, what, what day was it? It was the Wednesday, Wednesday so two when days out from the weigh-in. Yeah, two days out from the weigh-in, he turns back up to the hotel with a, a full tub of ale on top. He says, he says, right, you can eat this. I said, ice cream. It's ice cream. <laughs> I said, are you sure? He went, yeah, yeah. Just, was, you, you just go and go back to the room now, that's your, your treat. And I went to him and I said, well, if I step on the scales in the morning <laughs> and you hear a knock on the door, 
I said, you best run, because that means he's no good. So I went slept back. for about two hours that night. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it did thing and woke up lighter. And it, it, it goes to show that, you know, when, again, I don't second guess anything that he says because... So much nuance it, in there, right? If you're not yeah. being steered in the right direction, yeah. it's tough to know exactly where you're headed. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think it's uh, on that final, final week, you know, before the weigh-in, that's such a crucial time for boxers and it's a time that I've always said to Scott, look, during camp, we need to be 100% on it. So we map out every single meal, every single snack, uh, pretty much every single electrolyte, fluid, etc., so that we make sure everything's on point. And uh, it, at that stage, it's about making sure that we gain all the competitive advantages we can over the opponent before we step in the ring to give Scott that added confidence and know that, you know, subjectively he's feeling good, objectively with the testing markers, he's, he's, he's doing great, he's flying. But in that final week, that's when a lot of boxers, I feel, can trip themselves up um, and they can put their body under too much stress and, and just by either not eating food or eating the wrong types of foods. And it's in that final week that this is where the trust and, and buying is really tested. Um, you know, I've handed in that final week. I think the morning of the weigh-in you had um, Hershey's, chocolate, right, yeah. Hershey's chocolate syrup, some banana on a, like a pancake or yeah. a something and um and you couldn't quite believe it and no, people were walking past you in the hotel just thinking what's this guy doing is he giving up with the weight or something <laughs> and uh but it, it, it for the final week it's it's just kind of flipping it on its head so all throughout camp will will you know pr provide nutrient dense foods high in you know fiber high in the right types of nutrients at the right times um, but in that final week we pretty much flip it on its head in that we we try to go for low volume foods low fiber foods and low salt foods um, and relatively low carbohydrate as well which is when i get to a new venue so the last fight scott fought in boston i probably spent half my time in in whole foods just yeah. looking at you know for these magical foods that fit that category um, but what that does is it really helps to somewhat artificially bring down the weight so Scott will still be eating. He'll be getting plenty of energy in. So for example, with the eggs, we'll do scrambled eggs or we'll do fried eggs, but we'll do, do it with olive oil because the actual weight of that meal is very low. It's low carbohydrate, low sodium, low fiber um, and low salt, but it's a high amount of energy if you put a good bit of olive oil in it too. So that keeps Scott's energy levels high. Um, and then with the ice cream, uh, just another example would be, you know, the, the ice cream that we chose was low fiber, it was relatively low carbohydrate, had a good amount of protein in it too, um, low salt. Um, and actually I said to Scott, you know, when you pick up that tub, yeah. does, how much does it weigh? And he said, oh, not very much. And then you see the, yeah. the cogs ticking and Scott's like, oh, okay, so if I eat this, that's how much I'm actually going to put on. And I said, yeah, but between now and the morning, you'll process it and any money you'll come down downstairs weigh yourself and you'll be a pound or two lighter. So it's not about eating less during fight week, it's just about choosing the right types of foods at, at the right times, really. Doc, in that week building up to making weight, I know a lot of fighters or traditionally may have used a lot of water loading strategies in order to make weight. Can you uh, walk viewers through what that process is? Yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's all about making making a strategy that's right scientifically and physiologically, but also a strategy that's right for the boxer, so that's right for Scott. Um, so it's something that we'll, we'll map out in advance, we'll, we'll talk about, um, and everybody on the team will kind of be crystal clear with and most importantly, Scott will be happy with it too. I guess it's about, we have to think about the, the, the degree of the, the final weight cut in that acute phase, the final week, how stressful was that on Scott's body? Um, and what can we do to kind of replace essentially what was lost? And, and that particularly comes true in terms of the amount of fluids and the amount of electrolytes that we need to replace, um, but also the carbohydrate loading strategy as well is really important. Um, and I think that's where the sweat test comes in really useful because all throughout camp, Scott's been training with the right electrolytes that fits with his physiology. Um, and then after the weigh-in, we, uh, we can replace those electrolytes using a specific f formula that's, that's unique to him, really. With the carbohydrate loading, it's probably the most fun part of, uh, uh, of the camp for a boxer. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, we, um, 
we, we just try and focus on high quality carbohydrates initially. Um, there'll be you know high glycemic index, high glycemic load. Um, we do use a particular sports drink um, that I think is fantastic. Um, it, Scott's really responded well to it this camp uh, that we have shipped over from uh, Sweden. Um, that's a sports drink that essentially forms a high that when you drink it, it forms a hydrogel in the stomach um, because the drink or the fluid reacts with the acidity of the stomach. Um, and because it forms a hydrogel, it then pushes into the bloodstream and loads into the muscle much more quicker. So I think that's great for a boxer because when the carbohydrate loading, they obviously need to get a large amount of carbohydrates in, but they don't want to feel too full and too, you know, kind of groggy or slow. You know, they still want to be sharp for the, the couple of days leading up. So that's where those kind of drinks can come in really useful because they don't sit heavy on the stomach and they're, they're rapidly loaded uh, to kind of refuel the, the, the muscle, but also importantly, the liver glycogen as well. And does that come in right after the weigh-in then? Is it some liquid nutrition strategies followed by some solid food? Or yeah, it, could, like? it, it depends on, on who, who the fighter is and what they prefer really. But, but with Scott, we'll, um, we'll give him the electrolyte drink uh, and also then the carbohydrate-based drink as well. I'll encourage Scott not to down it too quickly. Um, but fortunately, you weren't too thirsty after the last weigh-in, so you kind of just sipped away at it slowly. Um, because we had an ample amount of time to kind of refuel um, if it was a 12 hour way in to fight, then we might look to kind of drink, you know, a bit more sooner um, just to help that release process of the electrolytes and the carbs. Um, but with Scott, yeah, it was just a couple of, couple of drinks uh, and a couple of snacks. And then after that, we went and sat down and had a, had a proper meal. And Scott, what's that like for you? Are you just dying to eat at that point? How does this compare to, again, previous camps um, post weight? For the last one, you know, not before this one, you know, normally I'm um, you dying to eat, you're dying to drink, and you know because of you've you've not done it right, you've starved yourself of certain foods, certain liquids. Um, whereas for this one, you know, everything was on point. Was you know, like I said it was a strategy there all week, and we followed it. And once I'd weighed in, like I said, I wasn't dying to down the drink and, and rush things, everything, I was, I was at peace, I weren't, like, I weren't, weren't stressed, everything was going to plan, and so, because everything had gone so well in training, and, you know, up until that point, and everything Scott had said, I'd followed to a T, so, again, I'm not gonna, you know, he told me, take your time with the drink, have these, have this, and then have a couple of snacks, and then we'll, get the food later, but not to you know, rush the drinks. So what he said, I just followed again, and it was, it, it worked, and it's, it's the best I've felt. Terrific, so noticeable the difference then than from previous. Oh, listen, it's like, again, I, I used the uh, phrase, it like night and day, and it, and it was, you know, just no, just felt a lot more comfortable, and, and everything was just, I just felt like I was unbeatable. Fantastic. And Doc, I know this idea, if we circle back to clean eating versus eating for performance, I know it's mm. one that's definitely confused yeah. a lot of Doc's practitioners, athletes. Um, you know, why is, from, from way in to fight night, why is not eating, you know, two or three heads of broccoli or all these sort of really high fibrous foods, why is that not <laughs> the strategy? Why is it different between the clean eating and eating for performance? Yeah, I think it, look, the, the, the fight is one uh, in terms of in, in terms of the nutritional impact, the fight is really won over the eight to 12 weeks, um, you know, with the types of food that Scott's eating. So he will, will map things out where he's training high carb, he's try, training moderate carb, he's training low carb. So we're getting all the physiological adaptations that, that he needs um, in, when he's in the ring. And that's all about the so-called clean eating, eating nutrient dense foods eating carbohydrates at the right time, restricting carbs at the right time. And one of the biggest mistakes that I see boxers make is that they restrict carbohydrates too much during camp and they don't train with them at the right time. So one of the things you know, we had Scott do was take um, uh, an energy gel during sparring or select sparring sessions um, so that we trained his carbohydrate metabolism to use those carbohydrates when he, when he needed them for the high intensity movements. A lot of boxers will carb load after the weigh-in, but they probably haven't taught their 
body how to use those carbohydrates efficiently, um, which can then in rounds seven, eight, nine, ten, take those gears away. So in the week of, or sorry, after the weigh-in, I think it's important to get those nutrients in, but we've got those in throughout the eight to 12 weeks, so it's not too much of a detriment if Scott isn't gonna have his cauliflower or <laughs> his feta cheese or whatever it is that he likes that you know is super, is super salads and, and that. It's about getting the right types of fuels in, um, because what we know is if you have a large amount of fat or you have a large amount of fiber, then that can actually sit quite heavy in the stomach. It can prevent the release of carbohydrates or slow down the release of carbohydrates into the bloodstream and then into the muscle and actually impair that carbohydrate loading process. Um, so for me, it's, it's about the eight to 12 weeks are so important. And then that final week, it's almost slightly different. Um, but there's kind of a big focus on just getting exactly the right types of foods at the right times because it can have such a big impact, particularly if the fight goes longer than, than seven rounds, which Scott didn't experience during no. the last fight. But yeah, I suppose that's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> nice. And Scott, was there a learning curve for you at all in terms of when you're changing over this nutrition strategy or was it simply you get the list, you execute and no, off you go? The, the, just what I said is I like to educate myself and everything every part of training whether it's s and c whether it's my boxing nutrition i want to learn i don't want to i always ask the question why only so i can understand so anything you know like say scott's ever said to me i've all yep not a problem but i always ask the question why just so i can understand and educate myself as in so that the more i understand it the better i can execute what i need to do um, and over the the camp and since working with it, I've learned so much and the enjoyment from becoming more knowledgeable on that is is all is made me, for instance, a better person but also a better athlete because I'm I, I know how to look after, you know, my self away from camp as well. You know, so I I'm not going eating a load of chocolate or stuffing my face with bad foods because then when I'm about to go into camp, I don't want to be starting from this point when I can be starting from this point. And it's just I, the enjoyment from my perspective from learning and just improving as a fighter as a whole is, you know, is, you know that's what I'm grateful for. Fantastic. And Doc, we touched on uh, the carbohydrate drink, but what about the role of, of other supplements that might be playing uh, as part of the nutrition strategy for Scott? Yeah, so just, I guess I'll just touch back on what Scott said just, just then, if that's okay. It's just that I think for me, it's almost a role, uh, it's almost a job me, myself to coach myself out of the, the role. So I, it's all good and well me telling Scott, you know, eat this, eat this, eat this. But Scott, we kind of start off the process where I'll send Scott the, the plan, the strategy for all the different days. And then Scott will write down what he would like to choose for breakfast, lunch and dinner. He'll write down when he's training, the times, how long he's training for. Then he'll send it to me and then I'll kind of look at it with a fine tooth comb and say, OK, maybe take that out there and put something like this in there and then we'll kind of fine tune it for the day. And at the start, I was doing that quite a lot. I was saying, you know, this, this is, but I'd always explain why. I'd say this is important for this reason, this is important for this reason. And then come the end of the camp, the final few weeks, Scott was sending me the plans and I just, perfect, 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 one or two tiny yeah. little tweaks. So it was great to see that Scott kind of... But it was, like I say, from the start, it was like me sending through a test sheet and him sending it back with a load of red crosses thinking, because there'd be that many changes. And then over the, the process of the weeks and that, it, there was less changes, less changes, and then like I said, towards the end, there was only a few in the mind, minor little tweaks. And like I said, that was over the weeks. And I was being educated and I was understanding the the methods and the, the nutrition strategy and, and the certain things that I need a lot more. And you know, that's what it was about, really. Get that immediate feedback yeah. as well. Obviously, pretty nice oh. you're moving in the right direction. And, and that's what I've got to thank him for massively is because basically 24-7, obviously with the time, me training in America, the time difference is, is like, I could be sending him a message and 
it, it's probably coming through about four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, and then an hour later, I'm getting a reply, and do you know his response and everything? He's he's top notch. Yeah, I mean, we talked about building trust and buy-in, which is obviously you guys look like you have, and communication obviously being a huge part of that. And mm. you sort of touched on it a bit there, but in terms of in camp, seemingly at all hours, right? I mean, athletes need information right off the bat outside of camp. How much over the course of this have you guys um, communicated, and, and what's the relationship like? Yeah, I mean, we went for dinner the other evening, yeah. didn't we? A couple of weeks ago, I think it was. Uh, yeah, we just still keep in touch. I think it's really important, like Scott touched upon before, that the, the, the box is disciplined outside of camp and obviously there's some room for flexibility in terms of, you know, it's important to go away, enjoy yourself, relax, unwind, have some nice foods that you, you know, might not be used to, but also just think damage limitation and think, you know, you're in this for the long term um, and you need to look after your body when you're outside of the camp. So I do like to just touch base with Scott but I mean to be honest he's, he's, he's one of the best you know he just keeps himself ticking over he even said before off air that you know you don't like it when you have a, a kind of day off you don't really know what to do with yourself so <laughs> it's, it's great on my side of things and I, you know I've got that trust in Scott he's got that trust in me and um, yeah so the communication is still pretty good and I think ultimately it's gonna it's gonna really pay off. Fantastic. And listen, Doc, if we sort of zoom back out to 30,000 feet mm. and we look at you know, sports science as it relates to combat sports, performance nutrition as it relates to boxing and combat sports, mm. you know, what's the evolution in the next five or 10 years? I think there'll be, there'll be I'd like to see, obviously there's uh, some really good research teams doing this at the moment, but just looking at the, uh, the kind of biomarkers uh, and the negative effects of the kind of dangerous weight cutting and getting that, that message out there to, to more and more athletes and trainers and coaches. Um, and then aligned with that is just implementing more practitioners who are actually working with the, the fighters and, and with the, the teams. I think that'll be the that would be the best evolution for it. I think we need kind of more practitioners in the trenches, uh, more, more research being done, but more practitioners in the trenches to, to help these guys because, you know, there's so many, so many advantages that can, be, that can be had, not just from making weight. I always say this to Scott, it's not just about making weight, but it's about making weight as well as possible and getting all those advantages we can over the opponent. And, you know, fortunately with the guys that I work with, they see, they see that, that benefit. Um, but until you've tried it, you wouldn't really know. So I think it would be great if more teams would be more receptive to bringing in practitioners um, and, and just seeing the positive effect that it can, it can have. 100%, very well said. And Scott, there's a famous quote that I heard Mike Tyson once say, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. What's it like to be in that ring on fight night? I say to, to, I say to everyone who, you, it's probably, the, the, it's the best feeling. I can't explain the adrenaline, the feeling, you know, from being in the changing rooms and then leaving the changing rooms. From leaving the changing rooms to then going to where you're going to start your ring walk, every thought goes through your mind. Every thought, you know, you've done this, you've, uh, you go through like a checklist. You know, I've done everything I can. I've done all these rounds of sparring. I'm prepared. I've done, I've done everything. Now, I've never had to do this, as in, if one of them haven't been ticked, as in, if you think, oh, I should have done more of this, or I should have done more of that, I couldn't think of anything worse walking to the ring thinking, I should have done more of this, or I should I walked to that ring doing a checklist, and as soon as I, I know I've done everything, I'm 100% prepared, and I know I'm gonna, you know, I get in that ring, and I'm, I couldn't be any more prepared. Walking to the ring, getting in there, and, and the first time you get punched in the, in the don't matter, I've had 30, 38 fights now, and until I get it in that ring on that, that fight, you know, I've, like I said, I've had 38 fights now, my next fight, when I get it, the first time I get in the, hit in the ring for, on that fight, you know, it's just, just excites me, the adrenaline, and there's nothing, you've just got to embrace it, you know, hey, you don't, you want, the, the, the art of the game is to hit and not get it, but if you get it, just embrace it and just deal with it, and he does make tight, that quote of Mike Tyson is, you do have a plan until you get hit in the face, you know what, you've just got to stay calm and 
hopefully just stick to the plan. But it's on one of my fights, I think it was two, February 2016, I had my jaw broke in the fourth round. Um, I carried on another eight rounds, lost by split decision. And do you know, you only know in, when you don't know how you're going to react until you're in that position. You know, when when the jaw went and I thought that was weird. Luckily, it wasn't painful, but every time I'm, I'm moving, my jaw's going, it's got a mind of its own. It's, it was one of them. I just thought, okay, I'll just, just, just don't get it on it again and we'll just go for it and just, that's just the mind, the mindset I had. And, but before that, if someone said, what would you do if you, your jaw got broken in the fight, and I'm thinking, well, probably to, to stop, stop the, the fight, get stopped, you know. <laughs> but when it happened, and I was put in that situation, something in my head switched, and it didn't bother me, and I just thought, well, what, what will be, will be, and we'll, you know, I still believed I was going to win the fight, but unfortunately I didn't. But it's just, until you're in that position, you don't know how you're going to react. Incredible, guys. Listen. What's ahead for Team Quig in 2019? I will become world champion. I will regain um, my world title. You know that's the that's the goal. Um, I you know I've worked my way back now into contention. Uh, a good win last time and 2019, I will become world champion. Phenomenal and Doc. Anything? Any lessons learned from this camp? that you could approve upon for the next camp in 2019. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that you know the field is always evolving in terms of the ways in which I can help Scott and ultimately that's that's my job is to make sure I'm at the top of my game and make sure that you know I'm constantly learning new things that we can implement into the camp and and that's what's been so great about working with Scott is that you know he he absorbs everything like a like a sponge. Um, retains the information. He's a student of, of nutrition as well as, as every other discipline that helps with his boxing, um, and that's brilliant because it means that we can then take it to the next level for the for the next camp. So it's just exciting times ahead, really. Fantastic, guys. Well, listen. Best of luck in 2019, and uh, we'll see you as world champ. Cheers. Thank you.